Let me introduce Sally Lego. She works for MLA and she's the program manager around adoption for Meat and, for meat and Livestock Australia, MLA, said that. Um, Sally also oversees um, the delivery of MLA's adoption programs um, and she's also responsible for providing forums and training with a real focus on adoption, which is fantastic, really useful. Um, she's also been responsible for guiding research teams and staff in how they embed adoption activities into research. It's very refreshing to hear that. Um, she's got a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture and she's also a graduate of the Australian Rural Leadership Program, so we'll exchange a secret handshake later. So I'd like to welcome Sally Lego to the stage. Thank you. Afternoon everyone. Thanks so much to Local Land Services for the invite to be here today. Uh, I can guarantee I'm not an expert in this space, but I've drawn on the brains trust from a lot of people across MLA and the different programs uh, that they're undertaking. Uh, I'm just going to quickly turn this around. And um, so today I'm going to try and whizzy through everything related to environmental sustainability uh, as well as the governance, sustainability and social sustainability pieces. So there's quite a bit here. Um, please don't feel like you need to take notes or take any photos of the um, slides. You're very welcome to, but I'll make sure I share a copy of the presentation with Rebecca uh, and you know she can email it out to you or however best you'd like to receive it. Um, so today I'm just going to do a quick context set. I want to share some of the global markets and in-market in, um, insights as to how we're in this situation we are today, um, both with uh, carbon neutrality 2030, um, but also some of the environmental credential pieces that are coming through at the moment. Uh, and then we'll also share uh, the industry sustainability frameworks, uh, some of the resources that we're developing to help producers like yourselves in this space. And if I uh, don't run out of time completely, I'll try and give you a quick CN30 uh, update as well. So, hang on to your hats, here we go. Uh, so let's kick off with a bit of a market uh, context piece. So, um, in our beef production size, uh, this graph on the left hand side highlights just how much beef Australia produces globally. So, we as beef producers in Australia produce 4% pr of global beef productions. When we then shift into, well, how much of uh, does the Australian beef play in an export market component? We represent 11% of all beef exports. And in that export market, we're competing with the likes of large producers like Brazil, US, uh, India. I should just highlight India includes their buffalo meat. That's why that's quite a large chunk, and Argentina. So we can't compete with Brazil for price. US has a very good uh, meat quality grading system as well. Uh, so we're a premium product and we need to maintain our competitive stance when we're competing against these guys. Um, any ideas as to how much of the Australian beef uh, that we produce is exported? What was that, 70? 70 percent, bit lower? Anyone else want to have a guess? Uh, well, in 2021 it was 47 percent. So, but you're spot on. Like the our exports of beef plays a significant part in the value that we receive here in Australia for our beef. So um, it is a really critical part for us. So shifting, shifting into the um, sheep meat side, uh, we, we produce 7% of global sheep meat uh, and that represents 37% uh, of exports. So we're quite a large exporter and significant player in the sheep market globally, but we're competing with New Zealand who has very good uh, green credentials like us uh, and a very similar product. So again, we've got to look for our competitive advantage uh, to ensure that we're maintaining our market share and market price. Uh, anyone have, want to have a stab, stab as to how many, what the percentage is of our sheep production is exported? I'll give you a clue, it's kind of similar to the previous answer. I haven't got any product. 51, look, you're 1% off, so I reckon that's a pretty good job. <laughs> Apologies, I should have brought prizes. That's why I got such uh, quiet answers. I wasn't offering good enough prizes. Um, so just shifting gears, so if we're thinking about, well, where should we be targeting our market um, 
aspects and where should we be prioritising our efforts. Traditionally, uh, in, when we think about marketing our red meat, we use population as a driver for that. So looking at this graph, by 2025, it's expected that China is going to reach close to 1.5 billion people. That's going to represent four times the amount of people that are in the US, uh, as well as we see significant growth into the EU. So you'd look at that and go, well, yeah, we should be tra targeting China, EU, US, and we're going to you know, really nail our exports. But the, the gurus in the MLA marketing uh, unit tell me that actually a better influence is the ability for consumers to purchase red meat. And given red meat uh, isn't always affordable for everyone, uh, they've looked at households that would have a disposable income of over US $35,000 per annum. And when we put that filter over this 2020 forecast, you'll see that China really shrinks down to 62 million. And we see that we've got, uh, I think for the EU, it's about a quarter of the population can afford to purchase red meat and a, a bit over a third for the US. So that's where our markets start to appeal in that they're markets that are willing to pay for a high quality red meat product. And uh, interestingly, uh, you know, Indonesia, which was about 200 million people, it's only 4 million people who can afford to, buy, to purchase red meat. So you can start to see where the markets are that we need to prioritise. And in this case, it's the EU and US. And I guess that's where I want to move into next, is thinking about those two markets and what's the type of red meat product that they want to purchase at the moment. Um, so when we talk to consumers in those international markets of the EU, US, and I'll add e um, UK in here as well, um, but also some of the Asian countries. MLA does a survey of those consumers in markets. And when we ask them, how do you associate red meat and sustainability? Most of the answers from those consumers is uh, a bit confused or um, unsure as to what the connection is between red meat and sustainability. But when we ask them about, well, which country do you associate sustainability and red meat more? Australia is the highest ranked country. So at 30%. And we're in front of the Kiwis and we're in front of the Yanks in their producing. Uh, so that's really important in, say, markets like Japan, where we have US and New Zealand both exporting into those markets. We've got a competitive advantage in that those consumers know that Australian red meat is clean, green, sustainable credentials. So that's, that's from the consumer's perspective. I'll shift now into what's happening in the investment or corporate world around this space. Um, when we start to look at the corporate world, ESG and environment are driving some of these trends. And in surveys with global management executives, uh, they're considering that the environment is their most important ESG factor. So 63% of them are considering that. And in underlying what's the determining factor as to why that's such a big focus for them, it's a split between the pressure they're getting from their customers who want an ESG type product and 46% from their investors. So if those corporate entities are trying to raise capital, their investors are asking them questions about, well, what's your environmental social governance structures look like? And what are the credentials for the products that you have? So I guess I just wanted to flag these. These are some of the pressures that are happening for those corporate entities. Uh, not just, it's not just about the consumer, but it is this investor or shareholder that's putting pressure on those companies. And that's a factor in how we are at this point that we're in today. So I just want to shift into then what's happening for retailers um, once we head into these international markets. So again, MLA does regular surveys with uh, the retailers in these international markets. And what comes through here in these blue columns on the left-hand side, these are our more advanced markets. So we've included Australia in here, US, UK. And then in the green is the emerging markets of Japan, Korea, China, Southeast Asian countries and Middle East and North Asian countries. And we asked them about, well, these focus aware areas of sustainability, how important are they to, to you and the products that you're putting on your shelves? Um, and for our advanced markets, and particularly for the US and UK, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon neutral products come through really strongly. Uh, and then for the UK, we move into animal welfare, uh, health, nutrition, food waste, so forth. For our emerging markets, while there is differing ex expectations around greenhouse gas gases and whether it's a reduced emissions product or a net zero product, nearly each one of those countries are still looking for some type of product that can explain 
its carbon credentials. Uh, but there's also a strong emphasis on how food packaging, health and nutrition is also playing out. So that, that's, I, I guess I wanted to flag that that's also a really big driver in this space because it's retailers like Marks and Spencers, Costco, uh, I'm just trying to think of some of the other big ones, um, Sainsbury's, those guys have signed on to COP26. So they've made commitments around um, their carbon emissions. So they're looking for products that can help them uh, demonstrate those credentials. So again, that's where some of the pressure is coming from uh, in why we're approaching what we're doing. And just quickly, um, I know some of the presenters today can probably speak to what their own company's commitments are, but I did just want to give you a quick snapshot on what that looks like for some of these big players um, in their supply chains. So Unilever, one of the biggest uh, corporate entities in the world, uh, they've made a, a commitment that they'll reduce their greenhouse gas impact of their products um, by 50% by 2030. Um, and that's comparing against a 2010 level. Uh, JBS has said they'll have a net zero greenhouse gas global supply chain and zero deforestation by 2035. Cargill, uh, who we've got speakers here today, um, wants to have a global supply chain emissions reduced by 30% by 2030 and zero by 2050. Kellogg's wants a 65% reduction by 2050. And McDonald's has come out with a deforestation eliminated from their supply chain by 2030 and 50% reduction in scope one emissions. I um, won't go through all that in huge details. Um, and some of the major lenders are also looking to reduce their exposure, the likes of Rabobank, NAB, Westpac, and so forth. Again, we'll hear from some of those speakers today. Coles um, has set a target, so when we move more closer to home, scope three emissions from their suppliers um, is a net zero by 2050. And uh, Greenham's, who we'll hear from later on today, is also um, have a sustainability brand and standard that they're setting uh, for their product into the US. So that's just a quick snapshot of how these things are already moving within the supply chain. Um, and I've, I guess I just wanted to highlight some of the pressures and why these movements are happening within the supply chain. Um, if you jump onto some of these companies' annual reports, websites, you'll see all these statements on there. Um, but I've just tried to summarise them in one slide. So how's MLA responding to this? Given we've got these great insights from the market, what are the actions that we're taking? Um, so MLA has a role in supporting the industry-led uh, and owned uh, sustainability frameworks for sheep and beef. And I'll just quickly take you through those to start with. Um, so in thinking about these frameworks, as I said, they're, they're led and owned by the industry. And they're focused on what consumers as well as investors are looking for uh, from a red meat product. And for us to be able to have a central point that can demonstrate transparently the credentials of our industry uh, in a mean annual report that we can provide uh, that's able to verify uh, the data across these different metrics. Um, in regards to the sustainability definition, it's about making sure that the triple bottom line elements, so economic, social and environment, are all in balance for current and future generations. So essentially um, that we're not just environmentally sustainable if it comes at a cost of being economic sustainable. And I guess that's a really strong emphasis from MLA. Um, we wanna make sure that whatever uh, actions producers might need to take in response to some of this is that it's something that's going to have a benefit for the production and profitability of that business. That it's not just solely focused on one of these elements of sustainability. Um, so how do the Australian Beef Sustainability Framework and Sheep Sustainability Framework uh, operate? Uh, there's a steering group uh, that is uh, uh, skills-based and elected to help guide these frameworks. Uh, there are strategic plans and work plans that are prepared. The um, strategic plans are set about every three to four years. Uh, my understanding is the Sheep Sustainability Framework strategy is coming to an end. Uh, and they'll start to look to set a new one, uh, and the beef one has just commenced. Uh, as well as they also outline the work plans each year that need to be taken with some of the metrics that need to be collected. The material, oh God, I knew this word would catch me. The mater materiality assessments are the areas that are focusing on what are the sustainable uh, components that we need to measure, and are these the correct ones that we need for consumers? I'll go into this in a little bit more. 
But a key part of how um, the frameworks work is making sure that we've got that information to demonstrate um, the credentials we have. There's extensive stakeholder engagement for both frameworks, both with producers but also the supply chain. So in trying to marry that, that uh, piece of, well, what's the data we have to demonstrate the sustainability credentials we have and how does that match up with what the uh, consumers and investors are searching for about the Australian red meat industry. Uh, and those are held multiple times throughout the year. Um, we just had the beef sustainability framework uh, consultation, I think maybe two weeks ago, and the sheep sustainability framework's coming up in the next two weeks. Uh, um, and then annually, both frameworks provide a report on the industry, latest industry stats and to speak to the changes that have happened in the previous years. Uh, I've got copies of both frameworks with their latest reports. They're very big and very heavy, so I really hope that each of you take a copy home and have a, um, have a look through it and get familiar with it yourselves. So speaking to the materi materiality assessments. So these are very much based around two measures. In trying to determine what are sustainability measures that we should be capturing, we assess it based on well, what is the impact of that measure on the industry and how much influence does it have for our stakeholders in the marketplace? And when I say stakeholders, it's the consumer and investor component that I've spoken to so far. Uh, and what comes through is uh, we'll then rank these different um, focus areas based on their, how important they are with the ultimate um, really significant areas that we want to capture being in this top right-hand quadrant. So the sheep one's probably the easiest one to see on that screen. So if you look in the top square, top right-hand square, you'll see that animal well-being and welfare and adam, animal husbandry and handling are called out as um, being significantly influential on our, mem on our stakeholders, but also have a significant impact for the sheep and meat uh, industry. Similar when we look over in the uh, beef sustainability framework, so this is coded a little bit differently. So there's some brown uh, dots there in the top right hand corner. Again, they're based around best animal care. So animal husbandry, processing uh, activities, livestock transport, so forth. So that's, again, that sort of helps us determine well, which ones are the priority areas that we need to make sure we've got good robust data behind. Um, and where do these fit in as we move around? Now, they can move every three or four years, their importance, because we're being driven by, well, how much influence does that have over the stakeholders? And they can change. So at the moment, there's a strong emphasis on animal wellbeing, but we could see that shift that there could be greater emphasis on biodiversity or things like that as they come through. I'll keep moving on because I'm conscious <laughs> I've got quite a bit to cover. Um, so the Australian Sheep Beef Sustainability Priority um, Pillars are uh, very much focused on uh, the animal, the environment, the economic and the people and community. People and community is probably a data set um, that we as an industry need to work on improving a bit more, so being able to demonstrate anti-slavery components, uh, good workplace practices, so forth. Um, we have all those, we're in a very strong position, we're just not very good at reporting it. Um, and compared to other ESG type frameworks, um, a difference with our industry is we're capturing information about the livestock component. That isn't generally reported on, but given the emphasis for the industry and the product we have, that's why they're in there. Um, and similar components for the sheep sustainability framework. I'll keep moving. Um, so what's some of this data? How do we report on the data? Um, so in this component, for the sheep sustainability, we have different measurements around how many producers mules their flock, um, how many have a good uh, appropriate pain relief component. Now those yellow stars mean we don't have enough data for that, so we need to work on that. Uh, the green dots that look across here for these different metrics are really sound and they're trending in the right direction for the industry. And the yellow dots are that we've got good data but we're probably not progressing as fast as what we'd like. So that's just a quick snapshot on some of that data, but you can get all of this out of the reports that I've got out on the table. Um, consequently, both frameworks consult with a broad range of stakeholders, and this is just a snapshot of some of the stakeholders that uh, engage regularly in the frameworks or are using the frameworks, uh, either for their reporting processes or how they develop their own. Uh, so it's a really wide representative base. Um, and really speaks to the depth across the supply chain that this engagement's occurring. So, 
Why is it important? Hopefully the previous slide gave you some, some of the previous slides help that. But who's using it and why are they using it? Um, so I guess just a couple of really good examples here. So Greenham's have been using the beef sustainability framework to help guide their own um, data collection metrics they ha that they have for their sustainability branded product. Um, Stockyard, uh, which has also applied the ABS principles, uh, has helped them secure Australia's first sustainability linked loan from the Commonwealth Bank. So by using this framework, that's in enabled them to access uh, some additional capital. Um, and I, I guess to the Chair's opening comments, um, this is feedback from the Australian Government, particularly in their international dialogues, particularly with the EU, from Erin Tomkinson, who's the Australian Agricultural Consular in the EU. These frameworks are essential for Australian advocacy with EU decision makers, being able to point out annual reports that demonstrate Australia's credentials and even more critically, the data contained in them to prove these claims is crucial to Australia's agricultural uh, reputation and our future trade into those markets. So this, this information is already playing a significant role in how we trade and continue to no negotiate with the EU. Rightio, quickly whip into some of the resources we've got available for you, and I'm really conscious on time, but I'll try to, try to whip through these. Um, I'll start off with MLA's been making investments into an environmental credentials platform. So for anyone who might be starting to think about, well, how am I going to demonstrate the good work I'm already doing on property into a supply chain? Where do I start? What data is available? So forth. MLA's made an uh, investment in with the Australian Government as well as also the University of Queensland and World Wildlife Fund to pull together, well, what would an accredited uh, platform look like and what data, free, freely available data, could we access to help do this? Um, so over the last uh, four years, we've had this project in place um, and it was co-designed with 50 beef producers. So this environmental credentials platform is purely for grass-fed beef producers, but our goal is that we'll then move into um, a similar platform for sheep producers, but we've started off with beef. Uh, we wanted to make sure it was cost-effective, easily accessible and user-friendly, um, which are always a challenge when you're trying to design new software to keep it user-friendly, but I think we're certainly getting that as we progress. Um, it's an online platform with multiple measuring tools um, that utilises some of the remote sensing tools for pasture, so we can report on ground cover. So for anyone who might have been able to access or has been accessing the feed base monitor from SIBO Labs, that plugs straight into the environmental credentials platform. So you can demonstrate your ground cover over the past 20 or 30 years straight away with that free software. Um, the other component is the platform is secure, so it maintains the confidentiality, and it's a voluntary platform. This is not something that we expect every beef producer to use, but it is available for you if you choose to use it. Um, it's, it's something we think will be important as we continue to progress with uh, this type of data collection into our supply chains. Uh, the platform work, works to, uh, accredited, to accreditate producers at three different tiers. Tier one is where you have your MyMLA account, which uh, allows you to then connect into the environmental credentials platform, and that you've linked uh, your PIC into your MyMLA account, and that you've completed at least one of the online learning modules. So that'll get you a tier three, tier one status. Tier two is where you've uh, linked your property into SIBO Labs' uh, Australian feed base. Uh, you've selected uh, to report from a carbon calculator and you've completed all of the tier two learning modules, uh, including a biodiversity questionnaire. So through the environmental credentials platform, you'll be prompted with a series of online learning modules to complete. Um, these can be anything from pasture management through to um, livestock management, so forth. Uh, and then the tier three is where you've completed your carbon account uh, and biodiversity questionnaire for three consecutive years and completed all the further additional learning platforms. Uh, this, we've just been piloting <laughs> this platform over the last 12 months with producers. Uh, we've had over 100 users and of those 100 users, they've completed over 500 of the learning modules and 45 credentials have been uh, achieved through that platform. Big thank you to those 100 users who have been piloting it because they've provided us with a lot of feedback on how to make the platform easier to use 
uh, and reflective of the needs they have for their business. Uh, so we're looking forward to being able to um, share it more widely now with the industry as we look to refine it with the next version. Um, so yeah, just some of that feedback from, from the producers has been that uh, most people were satisfied with the tiered approach, but they would have liked to not have to start at tier one. Uh, they would have loved to be been able to jump in at tier two. So there's just been a sequential issue there that's just taken a little bit more time. Um, and we've had a bit of troubleshooting during the pilot phase, but we've made some improvements. And for anyone who probably looked at it 12 months ago, uh, the latest version of it, which uh, was presented at the Australian Beef Sustainability Framework a couple of weeks ago, has certainly made some huge leaps forward in making it much more user-friendly. Um, just quickly, uh, we've developed a training program to help producers get familiar with carbon. It's called Carbon Edge. It's a two-day training workshop um, aimed primarily for sheep, cattle and goat producers uh, with the latest information. The course covers everything from Carbon 101 terminology through to doing a carbon account, identifying areas of action and um, developing an action plan that you can actually implement on farm. Uh, we're just wrapping up the last pilot uh, in two weeks' time and we hope to be able to roll that out uh, over the next, from June, sorry. So keep an eye out for that, particularly if you want to learn more about this. It's a great opportunity to get yourself upskilled. Um, and then just quickly, some of the other additional resources available. Uh, we've got a number of e-learning uh, e modules on our toolbox platform. Uh, we've got the Quick Start Carbon Calculator, which you can access through your MyMLA uh, a course. I did it for my parents the other day. It took me 20 minutes with very basic data. Um, so you just, if you're just looking at trying to get a quick snapshot on what your number is uh, from a carbon account perspective, it's a really quick, simple tool. Um, but also you can model out different components. So if you're saying, well, what if I put, what if I turn my cattle off 60 kilos heavier and three months earlier? What does that do for my um, carbon footprint? And is that a, um, a significant enough action to help? Uh, and we continue to make those updates into the carbon calculator probably run out of time, Sarah, so I can hold off on the CN30 update. Um, but essentially, we've got some great news coming through. Uh, in the next six to eight weeks, we should have the next version of how we're tracking um, with carbon neutrality. I'll just quickly share a graph on that. Uh, so this is how we've been tracking since 2005, which is our benchmark. The orange line is up until 2021. We've been trending downwards. The two lines after that, uh, 2021, the orange line is if we were business as usual. So if we did nothing further than what we've already done, where will we land in 2030? The blue line is if we undertake combined actions around improving productivity, feed additives, um, a whole swathe of actions that we could take, where would we land by 2030? We would uh, we'd land about 88% on target, which is fantastic to think that we've made such great progress. So while it is not perfect that we'd be completely carbon neutral by 2030, we'd be a hell of a long way, and compared to some of our competitors, well in front of them in this space. So I guess I just wanted to share that so that um, you understand the progress that's happening uh, and what we need to do to achieve this next bit from here on. I might wrap it at that one, Sarah, if that's all right. Thanks, Sally, and I think it was worth hanging in there for that last slide.